I'm pushed record and there's signals. We've been talking to audio people recently and it's just like such a joy. They go, oh yeah, we understand. <laughs> right. Now that, that should be a lot clearer. I it is. Hope. It's good. Great. From Recorded Future News, I'm Dina Temple Rustin, and this is Click Here's Mic Drop an extended cut of one of our interviews that we think you might want to hear a little more of. Today, we're talking to Garth Payne. He's a professor at Arizona State University who has found a way to monitor wildlife in real time using our very favorite thing, sound. For the past few years, Gary Payne has been working on something that might seem a little outside his area of expertise. How is it that you came to be monitoring jaguars? Yes, it's... um... Garth isn't a zoologist or a biologist. He actually does something closer to what we do. He's a professor in interactive sound and digital media. And also of music composition in Arizona State University's Schools of Arts, Media and Engineering and the School of Music. In other words, a guy after our own hearts, an audio person. And we called him up because he's trying to use audio in a very untraditional way, as a kind of sonic alarm system that could save endangered animals from poachers. For years, people trying to prevent the killing of animals in nature preserves have had the data they need after the fact, after the gunshots have happened. They hear that low frequency energy of a rifle on some recording they retrieve months after the shots have already been fired. Garth Payne says he has a way to make that all happen much, much faster. We'll explain. Stay with us. And by the way, there are some gunshots in this episode. I'm Dina temple and this is Click Here's Mic Drop. This is a musical work Garth Payne composed in 2014 called Becoming Desert. It reminds me of that music that helps you sleep, but instead of a thunderstorm or ocean waves crashing on the shore, he has animals who make unexpected cameos. A buzz here, a chirp there. Garth has been doing this kind of work for decades, recording everything from Pacific tree frogs in California's Sequoia National Forest to sirens wailing at the Columbus Day Parade in New York City. And this expertise is how Garth ended up on a project to protect South America's biggest cat. The jaguar. The jaguar. In our episode on Tuesday, we talked about how, for the longest time, the monitoring of endangered species in real time was considered the sort of holy grail of conservation. Researchers wanted a way to quickly process the information microphones might pick up in a jungle so rangers could move in when they hear a sound that isn't supposed to be there, and maybe even stop poachers before they strike. So we were pretty surprised when Garth told us that he'd been doing some of this real-time wildlife monitoring for a long time now. It all started about five or six years ago, when Garth was talking to another professor at ASU, a wildlife ecologist named Jan Schipper. Who was then the director of conservation at the Phoenix Zoo. And Jan was telling Garth about a project he was working on building jaguar corridors in Costa Rica to help the very small population, endangered population of jaguar there. These jaguar corridors Jan was helping build are essentially strips of protected land that allow wildlife to travel without having contact with humans. At least that's how it's supposed to work. But Jan told Garth that he was having trouble with the project because poachers kept sneaking into the corridors. I mean, poaching is a massive problem. In Costa Rica, we know that historically four to five jaguar have been taken from this region every year. Um, Their populations are now endangered, so protecting the existing jaguar is, you know, a major priority. Jaguars are considered near-threatened by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which has a red list of threatened species. Do people want jaguar skin or teeth or... I mean, when you know they're poaching elephants for their tusks, why do they poach jaguar? Right, so a a jaguar coat might get (laughs) $20,000. 
What's so prized about a jaguar's coat? Well, if you know your big cats, you know that the jaguar is kind of tawny colored and has these spots. They're actually called rosettes, and they're distinguished by a black interrupted outer circle. And then the jaguar's coat color is at the center of each spot, which is then punctuated by a black dot. That's a long way of saying that the fur is beautiful and prized by the wealthy. So for people struggling to make ends meet, the return for the risk is extremely high for those people who might poach and get the skins and sell them. Initially, the Jaguar Corridor Project tried to deter poachers with something called camera traps. They're cameras that sense movement and then snap a picture. But people who weren't supposed to be in the park after hours had a simple workaround. The cameras needed to be within eyesight in order to get photographs. So the hunters would see the cameras and destroy them. But Gar thought, what if a surveillance system wasn't a photograph, but was a sound? And the microphones that would capture those sounds were hidden. We could put those devices much further up trees and out of the way. And so that's how that project started. So to make his audio trap work, Garth needed a few things. Something that was small and lightweight enough to put up into a tree, but could still communicate over a vast distance and run on a solar battery. We needed them to be fundamentally real-time. Like a wiretap, but in the jungle. Garth says the sound of a gunshot can go a long way toward helping rangers identify poachers, or there's someone in the jungle who shouldn't be, because the gunfire has a very distinctive sonic signature. That's why a gunshot, to our human ears, sounds different from, say, a branch breaking. Or a clap of thunder. Our perceptual abilities are extraordinary, right? I mean, if we hear a gunshot go off a mile away, we pretty much know what that is, particularly in a, in a natural preserve um, where there's just no other sound like it. But for technology to help, so you don't have to have a human with their ear to the jungle all the time, the technology has to be taught. So you say, this is a gunshot, this is a gunshot, this is not a gunshot. So Garth decided to attach a little microprocessor to a microphone and put it in a box with a battery and an antenna to see what it could detect and how fast. When a gunshot goes off, it's very loud. There's a subsonic boom and a, a lot of low frequency energy. And the microprocessor inside of that little treetop box, which Garth calls a node, got pretty good at identifying a gunshot. Once the mode had heard it, it sent word out via a low-powered wireless transmission system, which then went to a network gateway so it could tell the rangers. And then those gateways send the data out using a cell coverage from that location. Which then sends a message directly to a ranger's phone. All of this happens really quickly. And Gar says it's really accurate, but it has some limitations. The system functions sort of like the Wi-Fi range extender you might use at home. And one of the limitations is that the nodes that collect the gunshot data need to be able to see each other. He's testing other systems that don't need any line of sight. And then there are other challenges that Garth is hoping he'll be able to solve in the future by using artificial intelligence. For example, there are all these ever-changing variables that can interfere with the detection system, the kind of weapons people are using, or the weather. And this, Garth Payne says, is where AI comes in, because it can ingest tons of data and can find patterns, like maybe hunters don't like to come out when it's raining. We expect in the future to build some machine learning in the back end so we could develop a predictive algorithm to say that it's likely they'll be hunting in this region or this region um, on certain days so that the patrols can be pre-positioned for that probability. Because humans have patterns, you can take those patterns, put them in and right. say, okay, we'll put rangers here. Yeah, exactly. It gives us the potential to start thinking about predictive algorithms that would help position those uh, human forces in advance of likely poaching. To hear Garth tell it, he'd already be using AI if it wasn't for one problem. Now, you said that you initially weren't using machine learning and now it may be something that you fold in. 
Why weren't you using it? Was it did it just require too much computing power? Right. So uh, machine learning is computational heavy. So you you know you have to throw a lot of energy at it basically. So uh, one of the really big challenges here is to have very lightweight power and computational use so that we can maintain them with small solar panels you know remotely over long periods and it's only in the last couple of years that some boards have become available that we can do machine learning on that'll run in the kind of power range that we need still garth is optimistic that what once seemed like an insurmountable problem is now a very solvable one do you think of five years from now this is going to be a solved problem where we're going to be able to not only have real-time monitoring, but also have the kind of intelligence you need to get to this idea of prevention? I hope so, yeah. From Recorded Future News, this has been Mic Drop. It was produced by Kat Shooknecht and Sean Powers. I'm Dina Temple Raston. And we'll be back on Tuesday with an all-new episode of Click Here. Have a great weekend.